you got to start with the co-main event last night. Ju- uh, Juliana Pena is your new bantamweight champion of the world. She stunned everybody by submitting Amanda Nunes in round two. Rear naked choke uh, withstood the storm that was the first round. You know, was able to get into a bit of a scramble on the ground where her and Amanda Nunes were kind of tied up. She had uh, her arm held for a little bit and really kind of weathered the storm, but really took some big shots as well. You could see uh, that she was wearing it on her face. You're like, all right, um, you know, that, that made Amanda work, you know, but I didn't think anybody thought going into round two that she was in some serious danger. Uh, whereas I had some of those thoughts going into round two with the, uh, with the co-main event, but we'll get to that in a, in a, in a little bit, but she, uh, she gets into round two and I mean, they're slugging back and forth, man. It is, it, it, she is standing there in the pocket and Amanda Nunes looks a little bewildered. Like she is eating a lot of jabs. She is wild with her strikes. She's hitting, uh, she's hitting Juliana with some stuff, but nothing that's super clean, nothing that's super vicious. Nothing that won her the 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 belt over Chris Cyborg, that clean, uh, efficient, you know, piston like right hand that Amanda Nunes has has always shown. She was very wild, very wild, and it was leaving her open of you know a little sloppy, a little lethargic, you might say. And Juliana Pena uh, was taking advantage, just peppering her up the middle, up the middle with big time jabs and and hurting her. And you could see that Amanda's eyes were getting big and wide and. Um, they were, you know, Juliana was, as the round goes on, the steam on Amanda Nunes' punches were lessening and it seemed like they were, that her shots were really, really bothering the champ. So ends up getting her down. She takes her back. And basically as soon as she gets her arms around her, Amanda Nunes taps out and we have a new women's bantamweight champion of the world. Uh, the Venezuelan vixen man. And what a story it is. Um, we were talking about this. I'm doing a new show now on BetQL Tapped Out, so we're doing a big preview show. And we had Sugar Rashad Evans on the show, and shout out to Rashad for joining the program. And you know, we were asking him like, "Is there anything that you could see in this matchup that probably would give Juliana a chance?" And he's like, "You know, it's hard being champ that long. It's hard. It's hard keeping that same intensity. It's hard keeping that." That same drive, that same passion all the time, never, ever relenting on it. And Amanda's had a ton of changes. She's now been defending a couple divisions. Um, We know that she had COVID going into this. There's going to be a lot of second guessing. Uh, I think mostly and first of all, let's give Juliana Pena credit. Very few in the world gave her a chance. She was a minus uh, Amanda Nunes was minus 1100 going into this fight. Very few people picked Juliana Pena to win this, but her confidence was unwavering. It's very similar to what we saw a couple weeks ago with Tia Fimo Lopez and George Cambosis. The only difference is, is that the champion there with Tia Fimo Lopez is very green, young Amanda Nunes. She is the goat. I mean, she's the greatest of all time to do it. And you know, we're asking like, if this were to happen, would this be the biggest, the second biggest upset of all time? To me, this is bigger than beating Ronda Rousey with it when Holly Holm beat Ronda Rousey. You know, Ronda was a pioneer. A lot of people have dumped in her. I haven't been one of those. I loved watching Ronda Rousey fights. I love what she did for the sport. I'm talking about this today with uh, with my wife, but we were watching. It's like, man, it was crazy. You saw in the early goings of tonight's fight, and they had. The uh, it was the very very early prelims of this of these uh, these cards, and you had Aaron Blanchfield taking on Miranda Maverick, and they were talking about the story of how Blanchfield was fourteen watching the debut. It's like man, that's crazy. You know, she's a kid watching the UFC, you know, change before our very eyes, and now you have two women co-main eventing. They've main evented plenty of pay per views. But like I remember the story very vividly when Dana White came out on TMZ and said he's never going to allow women in the UFC. So, and it's so crazy that the women in this sport have been so fantastic. They have some of the 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 most holy bleep moments of all time. You think of what Holly Holm did. 
to Amanda Nunes. You think of what uh, Misha Tate did to Holly Holm. You think of, you know, Rose Nami Yunus and her first knockout over Joanna Yunjaychik. You know, all of these moments, Amanda Nunes knocking out Chris Cyborg. Like these, these moments that some of these ladies have been able to put forth to thrill you as a fan has been absolutely unbelievable. And Juliana Pena now goes in the pantheon of that. And honestly, I think it stands the top just because as great as Ronda was, and she was great. Um, and I do think that that fight against Holly Holm was probably watched by more people because, you know, Ronda was doing crazy pay-per-view numbers. Amanda was at a point where she felt peerless. Like nobody really had a chance against her because she had beaten everybody. She had beaten Ronda. She had beaten Misha. She had beaten Holly. She had beaten Cyborg, beaten Valentina Shevchenko twice, no matter how close you thought it was. With Ronda, it was like, yeah, she was beating everybody, but there was really nothing to compare her against, you know? It's like, it, you know, it's like comparing it to the, the pioneer days of the UFC. And so, yeah, this for me is a bigger upset than it was with Ronda Rousey losing to Holly Holm. It's a bigger deal. And for Juliana, I think that she is, uh, she's a hell, I think it's a, I think it's great for the division, quite frankly. I think that Juliana is, um, her bravado, her swagger is a great thing to have as a champion. And she kind of has the whole package. And the thing with her is, I don't want to act like we all saw this coming. I didn't. I don't want to be a phony with you guys. I was talking up some reasons of why I thought me, you know, people were asking, ah, were there any reasons it was on last night with uh, with some people on the Beck QL network? Like, do you have any good reasons? I'm like, I have reasons, but I don't have good reasons why I think Amanda should lose the fight. You know, going down to Bantamweight for the first time in a long time. You know, just kind of getting sick of it, uh, having COVID in the summer. Maybe she didn't feel that great, uh, but I don't. I didn't account for any of those reasons to be good reasons why this was going to happen. I still thought Amanda Nunes was going to pull this thing out, either by decision or was going to stop her. I still thought that she was at the end of the day going to get her arm raised. I certainly didn't see in round two she was going to get submitted. No way. No bleeping way. I didn't see that coming, man. Nobody did. Very, very few did. Very few who aren't related to Juliana or Coach Juliana Pena and very, very few in the betting or mixed martial arts community. So what a thrilling show by her, man. She was awesome yesterday. And Amanda saying that she checked out, you know, felt like she handled it very well. I am um, not surprised to hear stuff like that. I'm really, really not. Not surprised to hear things. You know, you, you could hear this week one thing with with Amanda, and, and, and hindsight is twenty twenty with this, but, you know, she was not, like, jacked up with taking on Juliana Pena. You, you know, talking about the, uh, you know, wants fresh faces, wants fresh contenders, all this type of stuff. Um, You know, and, and it's, a, it's a tough go. It's a tough go today. Tough go for American Top Team. Uh, we'll get to the – let's get to the main event now uh, as – Charles Dubronx Oliveira, he remains your lightweight champion of the world. Third round submission, jiu-jitsu, shout out. Third round submission of Dustin Poirier, beating him by rear naked choke as these two, what a first round they put on, back and forth, first of all. I mean, it was a super competitive first round, but it definitely leaned Dustin Poirier. This is the second time we've really seen Charles Oliveira now Back-to-back first rounds, first when he won the belt, and now where he defends the belt, where he took some serious punishment. I mean, he took some serious punishment, but the thing that was always crazy about it, I don't know if it's like a cage dope type of thing, or it's a, or he's just genuinely hurt and is tough as hell, but every time he kind of like took a shot and was like, looked like he was uh, eating a lot of, uh, like he was eating a lot of power and was getting knocked back. He, he got right back into Dustin Poirier's kitchen each and every time. Each and every time he took one of those bombs from him and it looked like this was going to be big trouble for Charles Oliveira, he got right back in Dustin Poirier's face. And I do think that you saw a little bit concerned at the end of that second round, uh, at the end of that first round, excuse me. Dustin's like, man, this guy's not gone yet? Because I, I, I mean, genuinely, I think you see Dustin hit those shots on a lot of guys and, and they go. 
or they're just severely deterred and 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 uh you know it's going to be a matter of time charles Oliveira looked fine like he he took a lot of punishment sure his face didn't look great coming out of the corner but he didn't look shook. he didn't look shook didn't look shook at all and then they get into this weird scramble where dustin's gloved there was some dirty tactics with with charles Oliveira. It looked like he grabbed us and poured it inside of his glove dustin ended up rolling and then basically having Oliveira on top of him and so he starts like tightening him up and it kind of looks like he's trying to neutralize him basically so the ref will stand him up but the strategy kind of backfired on him throughout the round because Oliveira then started finding his range with the elbows and really started landing some big, big shots. And two of the judges gave Charles Oliveira a 10 8. I didn't think it warranted a 10 8. I didn't think that he inflicted enough damage. It was, uh, it was an unfortunate position that Dustin Poirier was in, but I didn't feel like it was like a, a game changer. I didn't feel that. But certainly. Dustin had to be feeling a little bit shook from the fact that he had the first round that he did. He had so much success and all of that kind of felt like it was erased after the first round and uh, third round happens after, after that second round, kind of a debacle for, uh, for Dustin Poirier, but okay, that round's behind you. It's one, one, I think in most people's eyes and they go to round three and very quickly, Charles Oliveira gets in transition, gets Dustin Poirier's back, climbs up on his back, and puts him out like a like like a like a reptile squeezing the life out of its prey. And that's all she wrote. That's all she wrote. Charles Dubronx, Oliveira is your champion. Huge for him. I mean, what does this mean for him? Okay, I, I the things you know, guys. If you're a listener of this show, you know I'm a huge Dustin Poirier homer. One of my favorite fighters, probably my favorite fighter on the roster. I love watching Dustin Boyer. Um, this was the last. I was very much rooting for him to get this. Is the last box to check for him to become undisputed champion of the world, and put it off a little bit because he was, uh, you know, was presented with the opportunity to fight Conor McGregor again, and instead. You know, now he's he's kind of back to the drawing board. He's now lost in the he's now lost in the undisputed championship fights twice. He's been choked out both times, um, and had his moments in both of those fights where you know had the submission hold on Khabib, and then in this one had the great first round, but you know is now kind of back to the drawing board. I don't know where he goes from here. It's going to be an interesting thing. You know, he is uh, he did talk in the uh in the lead up to this fight that he was maybe going to go up to 170 i um you know i would say this you know seeing the way that charles dealt with him on the ground the matchup that i was thinking of between dustin and kamaru man i think that would be trouble for him or or even or even him versus colby i think could be a little bit of an issue for him for sure because there are some really good wrestlers at 170 um listen he's got some uh, and then you think maybe about a Hamza Shemaev or something like that and then listen there's still uh Islam Magachev and and Benil Daryush who are coming up I, I think the thing for Dustin that's gonna be interesting though is like do you want to go to 170 where you will have your fan- hands full of some grapplers but you probably will still hold your own as as a striker for sure um and I think they're bigger fights or do you want to be in this lightweight division where all right, who's there? You got Michael Chandler. That's a good fight. I'm into that fight. But what does that fight really do for Dustin Poirier? It's huge for Michael Chandler. Michael Chandler was talking a, a whole lot, whole lot on, on on Twitter tonight for a guy who was knocked out by uh by Charles Oliveira in, in a in a in a in, in a in quicker fashion, lost in quicker fashion than Dustin Poirier, but for some reason was feeling froggy as all hell. Um so that doesn't really do much for Dustin. For Islam Makachev and Benil Darius, does he want to be like the gatekeeper guy? I'm not saying that he can't win those fights, but does what do those fights do for him? And and then, then Gaethje, he's beaten already, and Gaethje's probably going to fight for the belt next, which uh, we'll get into that with uh, with him and Bron- Du Bronx in a second. But you know, I, I think that he probably would look at the landscape right now, at lightweight, and be like, 
yeah, maybe it is time that I go up and he can go and fight, you know, Dustin Poirier, Vicente Luque, Dustin Poirier, Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. Um, and yeah, he's going to be the shorter of those guys. Dustin Poirier, Gilbert Burns. Like, there's a lot of fun fights. If he did want to go to 170, there's a lot of big fights. There's a lot of fun fights. And I think he gets one win. If he gets one high-class win in that division, I feel like he's probably going to get a chance against Kamar Usman because Kamar Usman's looking for, for big-time fights. So there's always a debate about guys jumping up, jumping in divisions, all that type of stuff. For Dustin... I think he's done all there is to do. Um, if he were to fight Charles Oliveira again, would he have a chance? Yeah. I mean, we saw that he had some strike. Could he come in with a better game plan? Perhaps. But, man, Charles Oliveira, after after suffering what felt like Dustin Boria's best punch, he found the path to victory very, very easily with the ground game. So, I don't know. I think for for Dustin, he has to figure out what he wants to do there. Uh, for Oliveira, yeah, he'll, he'll end up taking on Gaethje. And the thing with that is, you know, people will look at Gaethje and they'll say, oh, well, Gaethje, he'll be the one that'll break down Charles Oliveira. I don't know, man. Listen, I was a bit of a Charles Oliveira skeptic going into this because I was like, well, he's never been to the fourth round before. His resume is good. You never knock anybody for losing ten, nine or for winning nine fights and now ten fights in a row. You never really knock that, but... Compare his resume to Dustin's, like, come on. It, it, you know, Dustin's Dustin's got this. But, um, you know, it was close to the odds for a reason. And, you know, Charles being a, a champ underdog turned out to be a mistake because he did have more paths to win. He did have more paths to victory. And um, for him, I think it's going to be more of the same against Justin because, you know, Justin's got the leg kicks. That's definitely a thing, but, you know, I think we saw his struggles against Habib. Like, he's a guy who's vulnerable to that stuff, too. So, I think that, uh, I think Charles Oliveira, Charles Oliveira's an interesting one. Like, Charles Oliveira, with a win like this, you know, Habib's always talking about, oh, I want some, maybe if somebody ever shows me that they could take me on and could do it. If Charles Oliveira could go on some type of a run here, like where he is beating Gaethje, and certainly if he was able to beat Habib's protege, Makashev, maybe he could be the guy that gets Habib out of retirement. Maybe. And maybe he's got the, he's the guy that has the skills that could actually beat Habib Nurmagomedov. Because he's got that win streak. He's now taking out Dustin, who, who Habib did. He's probably going to take out Justin Gaethje, who Habib beat. But So I don't think that'll get Nurmagomedov thinking about leaving retirement. But if he beats his guy, if he beats Makachev, who's supposed to fight Benil Daryush, so maybe he doesn't even get there yet. But if he beats him, man, maybe that maybe that's the thing that that gets Khabib uh, out of out of, uh, out of retirement.